I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Um, we're really honored to have Nick Jorgensen with us this evening. He is the CEO and CFO of Jorgensen Land and Cattle in Ideal, South Dakota. Before returning to his family's farm in 2014, he earned his master's degree in business administration and economics. He studies the financial benefits of the soil health practices that his family uses to manage the operation's 13,000 acres and is determined that his family saves about $100 per acre and $350 per head annually, thanks to good soil health management. So what he's gonna talk about tonight is just the soil health and the economics of that. These two subjects that are not discussed really together, but they are linked. Uh, and so his presentation this, this evening will discuss how those two can work in tandem to improve the health of both your soil and the bottom line of your operation. And with that, um, Keith, do you wanna go ahead and kind of explain why we wanted Nick on this webinar and kind of green cover seeds connection to yeah. Nick? Yeah, yeah, no, thanks Noah. Yeah, uh, we've been working with uh, Nick and uh, his family for a number of years now, uh, the Jorgensen's up in Ideal, South Dakota. And, and Nick, I, frankly, I think your, your bio is way too humble. I don't, think you, I don't think you give enough background information there. Uh, the Jorgensen's, they're, they're, my understanding is you're the largest supplier of Angus genetics in the world. Uh, right. So their influence in the, across the Angus industry is, is huge. Uh, they also have a great hunting lodge. If you like pheasant hunting, they've got probably the top hunting lodge in South Dakota, uh, if that's of interest of you as well. Uh, and, and they also were awarded the Leopold Award. Many of you are familiar with the Leopold Award. I think about 2015, uh, they won that for South Dakota. So uh, Nick has a, has a really unique way of combining uh, the soil health with the numbers. And, you know, sometimes when you hear people talk about, well, you know, we made about $100 a head more this year than last year. You, you kind of take that with a grain of salt because you don't know who says that, but, but Nick's a numbers guy. He's, and you'll see that as he goes through his presentation. Uh, he is not just saying that because it's, oh, it's about this or about that. Uh, it's lots of spreadsheet work, lots of financial analysis. So what Nick's gonna be sharing with us, and I've, I've seen him do this presentation a couple times, uh, learn from it each time, look forward to learning more here this evening. Uh, it's it's real world stuff. It's it's and it's not it's not on 20 acres, you know, back behind the house. This is large scale uh, soil health, uh, real world application. So looking forward to hearing it. Uh, Noah's going to be recording this. So my guess is a lot of you are going to say, oh, I wish so and so could have heard this. So make sure you get him the link to watch this recording. So uh, with that, Nick, uh, I'm going to hide myself and you take it away. Thanks, Keith, and, and thank Noah, thanks, Noah. You know, uh, I'd just like to let everyone know to start off. It, it's, it's my honor to be here. I know Keith and Noah said they're honored to have me, but the truth is I'm just, I'm honored to have been asked to, to do this presentation and, and to get to, to speak with all of you tonight about the subject that I'm passionate about. And I'm just going to, before I show this presentation, just going to echo off a few comments that both Noah and Keith made. You know, Noah said usually when we talk about soil health and stuff, it, it's philosophical, right? You know, we have these conversations about what it does, the, the health of the soil, and those are all great. I mean, trust me, the story is important and the principle and the philosophy is very important. Um, but I am a numbers guy. I got a master's in economics uh, and we're, we're, we're trying to do this soil health stuff at scale. Uh, you know, 13,000 acres of farm ground. Um, we, we, can't, we can't rely on, you know, just, philosophy alone. Now, the philosophy is what justifies the practice, but we need to ground truth it with numbers. So that's where I come in. And so what you're going to see me talk about here are, you know, let's take the philosophy and then see if there's the numbers actually, you know, justify it. And so that's what this presentation is going to be on. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and I'm going to kick it right off. Um, and I also appreciate the the introduction from Keith about the operation uh, with that the bio and the explanation is pretty high level, uh, but I'll go into a little more detail here about all that we do here at Jorgensen Land and Cattle. So uh, this presentation is about soil health and economics. Um, the Jorgensen family has been in Northern Trip County, South Dakota since 1909. Uh, my great grandfather, Martin, Martin Sr. Uh, came to this part of the world uh, with his wife in 1909. This is actually the yard we're on today. We moved here in the 30s. Uh, this, this barn right here uh, is, is still here today. And this actually was our office. This white, this white farmstead was our office until uh, 2016. Um, 
We farm 13,000 acres of 100% no-till cropland here in Northern Trip County. Uh, it consists, it's a pretty diverse rotation. I'm not gonna go through the whole list, uh, but you know, the, the, the key takeaways are here, we raise, raise a lot of different crops. We're not just corn beans. Uh, I would say it's actually a primarily a winter wheat based rotation. Everything kind of keys off winter wheat. And uh, some of the, you know, more interesting stuff that we try here are, would be the mixed species forage. Uh, which a lot of times gets chopped for silage. Um, we did, we do every acre of winter wheat gets followed with a cover crop that we graze. And then the last couple of years, we've tried more and more uh, full season cover. So, you know, cover crop that we graze, that we plant primarily just to graze, uh, no harvesting done uh, with equipment. We also have 8,800, it's probably more like 9,500 acres of native prairie pasture here in Northern Trip County. So all told, we're managing about 22, 22, and 22,500 acres up here. Uh, all this pasture land is rotationally grazed, and uh, we manage our thousand, it's 850 head of Angus cows and 100 head of uh, recipient females that we manage here. They get managed in about five, maybe six groups, and we're rotating those groups every two to three days uh, in the spring, and then we stretch that interval out in the summer uh, to every seven to 10. But it's it's a you know it's intensive grazing management maybe not to the scale that you'd see a lot of places you know where they're moving cattle every day or anything like that but you know at the end of the day it, it's it, it comes down to logistics and people time and uh, we don't have you can't move a thousand head of cows in six different groups every day it just it doesn't work so we do the best we can with our resources uh, and like Keith mentioned um, probably the hallmark of our operation is is purebred Angus uh, genetics uh, we've been in the the Angus breeding business since the late 1950s. My grandfather, Martin, started with it, um, built a really good reputation for our cow herd uh, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, today, it's, it's that reputation that um, allowed us to build our unique bull leasing program, uh, which through that and associated um, what we call smart bull sales, which are mature bull sales, we'll market 3,500 plus Angus bulls annually. And <laughs> That, actually, that number is actually undershot by quite a bit. Uh, in 2020 here, I, I fully expect we'll exceed 4,250 bulls marketed um, during the calendar year. So it makes us the largest seed stock producer in the United States, presumably the world. I don't have data to back that one up, but I, I do have data to back up the United States one. Uh, and the whole program, the leasing program, is operated out of our feedlot here in, in Northern Trip County. And we'll go into some of the economics about, you know, how we manage animals in this feedlot and on crop ground uh, that really justify some of our practices. Uh, Keith did mention it and I don't, or he did mention it and I don't have a slide in here about the Lazy J Grand Lodge, uh, but we, we have a lot of pheasants up in this part of the world and we offer hunts, uh, generally run 250 to 300 hunters a year through our 22 bedroom lodge. Uh, and it's a nice, really a nice um, side business for us uh, in all truth. So today I'm going to talk about the economics of soil health and how we integrate crops and livestock to improve our bottom line. Now, I say bottom line because at the end of the day, that's how we're measuring it. But the initial onus here is not to be financially better off. It's, it's to improve the health of the soil and the animal. And what we found is you can do that and improve your bottom line at the same time. So let's talk about economics for just a second. Um, this, this slide really just goes in to say, um, you know, we are, we're in a tough time in agriculture. Um, you know, we come off what we call the egg super cycle here in 2013. And since then, you know, things haven't been just quite as rosy. There was more money made, I think, in those probably, you know, six, six seven years from 09 to, to 2015 than probably had been made gener in generations past. And so, you know, we had a really good time in egg, and then things kind of kind of leveled off. And there are still a lot of operations that are struggling to adjust to this lower price, lower income environment. And you know, the ultimate truth to dig a little deeper is the margins of you know straight up corn and soybean production are are not the best. Now, you look at the last quarter, last several several months, corn prices are up. Uh, you know, soybean prices are pretty darn good. Um, but for the last five or six years, it has not been that way. Margins you know, in traditional corn soybean production have been break even at best. We've been relying on, on high yields for profit. And to be honest, the margins in the cow calf sector are even worse. Uh, COVID did not do us any favors this year, uh, beat up a lot of operations in the cow calf and feedlot sector pretty good. 
So, you know, why do I bring up this economics discussion? And I do it because, excuse me, I'm missing a slide. So, yeah. So we, we talk about economics and then we talk about soil health. So, you know, you got economics over here generally and then soil health over here. And um, the, what, I, what we often see is they don't get, come together. So here's your five principles of soil health. You know, we talk about keeping cover on the soil at all times. We limit disturbance. Uh, we incorporate diversity into the crop rotation. Keep a living root as long as you can and integrate livestock whenever possible. So on our operation, we strive to, to meet all five of these principles whenever possible. Um, now let's marry them together. So we talked about how margins in ag are low and markets are volatile and things like that. Um, and then you got the other side of the coin, which soil health, you know, you can use to reduce costs and improve revenue. And, and we also know that diversity mitigates risk and helps deal with volatility. And so the point of this slide is to show that there are synergies here and these two things do work in tandem. And there are practices that can improve the health of your soil uh, and the health of your bottom line uh, at the same time. And to me, the focal point of this discussion where these two things come together, uh, you boil it down and it really goes back to organic matter. Let's talk about organic matter and why it matters. So to start that discussion, let's talk about native prairie soils. Uh, Tripp County, South Dakota, really, before we had settlers here, it was, it was all native prairie, right? Negative, native, shorter grass prairie. Uh, it's a natural crop rotation out on this prairie land, right? You know, we don't have to intervene. The species naturally rotate themselves, if you will. The diversity uh, is extreme. You see organic matters somewhere between four and 7%. Uh, and it's a natural nutrient cycle. There's a constantly active root system. The, the soil is healthy and bioactive. And so when we talk about the five principles of soil health, all those things exist here naturally on the native prairie soil. You know, it has proven sustainability with livestock integration. I mean, this ecosystem worked with herds of buffalo that came in and then went out uh, and helped, you know, harvest this grass and, and do what it needed to do with the hoof action to uh, improve. The, the soil to plant interaction by mashing organic matter into the soil and things like that. So organic matter, let's take that prairie soil idea and take it back to the farmland. That's kind of the idea. That's because prairie soil shows us what mother nature can do, right? That's, that's kind of gives us our natural, you know, kind of stable point, if you will. So when you have higher organic matter, uh, more biology can be supported. You know, it, it, organic matter is 52 to 56% carbon. Carbon supports life. Uh, the more biology there is in the soil, the more effic nutrient efficient the soil becomes. Uh, it, it inhibits, or excuse me, it, it allows more nutrient exchange between the plant and the soil when you've got that biology there. Uh, and it allows for, for more nutrient uptake um, because of biology. So to get a little more specific, for every 1% of organic matter, that we have in the soil, it generally leads to 20 to 40 pounds of nitrogen available to the plant in the soil, right? So when you look at a, like a native prairie soil, four to 7%, so just call it five and a half on average, you know, you're looking at somewhere between 100 and, you know, 50 to 200 pounds, depending on how you want to do the math of nitrogen there in the soil uh, for the plant to use. Uh, additionally, when you have a 1% increase in organic matter, we gain an inch of water storage. Organic matter is really good at holding water. Uh, and so what it does for us is it has less runoff. Uh, we're in kind of a, I wouldn't call it an arid part of the world here in, in Tripp County, but we get about, you know, 17 to 19 inches of rain a year. And we need every one of those inches. We don't need them running off our fields. Uh, and so every inch of water we can hold with a percent of organic matter, we'll take it. Um, and, and finally, there when you got organic matter in the system, it functions as a buffer, right? It makes soil more resilient under stress. So when it gets dry, you've got that water that was held in the organic matter to help the plants. You're also, you've got some naturally available nitrogen there. You've got more biology, acti my, more biological activity that allows for more nutrient efficiency in the soil. Functions as a good buffer to help that soil under stress. Um, here's just a graphic of some soil tests organic matter on all the crops on our operation, um, generally kind of where they've been at in the past, you know, real winners for us are grass naturally because grass is what grows out here. 
Um, and then you've got winter wheat and winter wheat cover. And I'm going to drill into this, uh, these two bars over here just a little bit to kind of go through the detail of why, why we like organic matter and, and cover crops some more. So we use cover crops as a tool to, well, really ultimately build organic matter. Um, but additionally, there's a lot of other benefits um, to cover crops. They improve the soil structure, right? And they, they maintain an active and diverse soil biology. Um, there's a living root in the soil in a time when we normally wouldn't have it. So this image is cover crop behind winter wheat. You know, if that cover crop was not growing in that soil system, there wouldn't be an active living root. I, I mean, the winter wheat is dead. We've harvested it. Um, and so we're using that cover crop to keep the biological interaction going. Uh, it uses excess moisture and it captures excess nutrient. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail, but, you know, let's just not forget nitrogen is a mobile nutrient. And so anytime it's just in the soil, you run a chance of losing it. But if I can tie it up into a plant for a while, at least I know for some certain period of time that that nitrogen isn't going to get lost. Um, it also improves soil structure, like I mentioned, uh, you know, just some kind of anecdotal evidence. We're generally out in the field planting corn because that's how we do this is we go winter wheat, cover crop, corn is the rotation. Um, so we're generally out planting corn uh, on fields with cover crops, you know, depending on how wet the spring is, we might be out two weeks earlier. Uh, on ground that had cover crop compared to maybe ground that was just straight up stocks like milo stocks or corn stocks. So it mellows that soil out. Uh, it reduces cost of bull development for us. And this could be amended to say reduce cost of animal development. We just say bulls because that's what we have to deal with and what we've got numbers on. And then cover crop also provides really good cover and food for wildlife. And I've got an image at the end that kind of goes, that really exemplifies that, but pheasants love it, deer love it. It's just, it's, it's good habitat, right? And so you're building just a healthy ecosystem, not just between the plant and the soil, but you know, with other living organisms um, in the ecosystem, deer, pheasants, birds, bugs, all that kind of stuff. So these are all the different blends of cover crop that we plan on our operation. And I, I have this graphic here, not to go through each of the different blends. Uh, you know, this, this is a, uh, we get a lot of these blends from green cover seed. As a matter of fact, the full season, that was a, a blend designed by green cover seed for us. Um, but we, tr we do a lot of cover crops in a lot of different scenarios. We tried some uh, in corn this year, in milo. Um, our silage mix really is technically probably a cover crop if you wanna call it that. Um, we had some full season cover this year. And then um, our winter wheat generally is always followed with some sort of cover. You'll notice uh, if you really drill through this, um, a large majority inside of what you inside of the blends is oats. That's what we carry our our uh, cover crop blends with. If you want to call it a carrier, uh, they're generally oat based, and we go with oats because we're a certified seed producer. And if we go with a carrier crop, if you will, of something like rye, that would make our lives really difficult. Rye probably is superior in all regards other than uh, it's a weed in the seed wheat world and we can't have it. So we go with oats. So organic matter, when I, when I mentioned that we use it to tie up nutrients, uh, it, it really, cover crops will help us tie up nutrients and build organic matter. So here's uh, the breakdown of this, the image I showed before of organic matter levels in winter wheat, and winter wheat cover. So when we find, we, we did it, it was a test several years ago. We took a quarter of wheat, we sliced it in half, two 80s. We did 180 with cover crop and 180 without. And what we found was we had a half a percent increase uh, in organic matter where there was cover crop in the winter wheat, right? Um, so that leads to that, what that ends up being is 10,000 pounds of additional rev residue per acre um, by having cover crop out there. We gained, you know, by, by the math that I would like to use about 20 pounds of N just by having that cover out there. We added a half inch of water holding capacity um, and improved soil structure. And we to date, and we've been doing this for over 10 years now, uh, have never seen a negative impact on yield, you know, in that, in that corn crop the next year. As a matter of fact, generally we see a positive because we can get out there earlier. Um, you know, we've mellowed that soil out quite a bit. But you know, here's just some objective measures to show that cover crop will help us build organic matter. 
And this is actually the slide where I talk about uh, nutrient tie up. This is the same field, same test, the half, half, 80, 80. Uh, and this is soil nitrate, um, six inches, you know, zero to six inches. And what you'll notice is where there's just winter wheat, we've got 55 pounds of nitrogen there in the soil, um, not being well used by the plant. There's nothing to use it during that time. When you look at the winter wheat cover, it goes down to 15. So what we've in effect done is tied up 40 pounds of nitrogen. And like I mentioned, nitrogen is a mobile nutrient. We don't know where it will be after the snow melts or after a big rainfall event, because it generally follows water. Um, but we do know that right now, when we took this snapshot with the soil test, the nitrogen was tied up in the cover crop. And you can, I mean, the cover crop is where it is, right? It's gonna sit on the soil, uh, it will decompose and it will release that nitrogen back into the soil profile, right? And so let's not forget too that we're me just measuring in here, but we're tying up other um, nutrients as well that we, that we wanna make sure we know where they are. This is also a really interesting slide as it pertains to cover crops, same um, study again, but this focuses around P1 phosphorus levels. Um, in the winter wheat, you know, the winter wheat without cover, our, our P1 levels was 11, were 11 as compared to nearly 18 winter wheat with cover. So where did that come from? Well, first of all, remember, it's, phosphorus is not a mobile nutrient. It doesn't move with water. So um, we're not concerned about that, but where did it come from? We didn't apply any more phosphorus on the winter wheat cover. Where it came from was, you know, if you've ever taken a, a soil health or a soil, um, a soils course, you got P1 phosphorus and P2. P2 is more what they would call plant unavailable tied up phosphorus um, that a traditional agronomist would honestly tell you doesn't really mean anything because the plant can't use it. Well. What happened here was we've got biology in the soil system that is in there breaking down these P2s into plant available P1 um, because we've got a, a living root in that system keeping that biology alive, therefore giving us eight additional pounds of phosphorus that I did not have to pay a dime for to get applied or buy or anything like that. All we had to do was plant a cover crop, right? And so not only does it capture nutrients, but it makes more nutrients available um, in the soil profile. Before I move on, I, I want to jump back to this slide right here where we talk about organic matter. I did a video um, here just a while back where we talked about carbon sequestration, right? And I, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the political side of the debate about climate change, but, you know, societally, there's a lot of concern about, about carbon. What do we do with carbon, right? And really, production agriculture generally doesn't get the best rap when it comes to our, what we do for carbon, because people don't understand what we're, we're doing at the very most simple level when we're raising crops. So, I mean, what, what do crops pull out of the air? They pull CO2, that's what they live on. They emit oxygen. So what are they doing? They're tying up carbon. And so, you know, I mentioned earlier, organic matter is 56, I think you could roughly call it 56 to 60% carbon. So when we tie up a percent, when we add a percent of organic matter to our soil, we have added 12,000 pounds of carbon. We have sequestered 12,000 pounds of carbon from the atmosphere into the soil profile. That is, that's six ton, right? And let's talk about adding a half percent farm wide on a 13,000 acre farm. That's, I mean, that's, that's rough math and I'm, I'm gonna get lost here, but 3,000, you know, excuse me, three tons per acre, adding a percent on 13,000 acres is almost 40,000 tons of carbon that we're sequestering on our operation. Um, I don't know how much carbon we emit here, um, but I don't think it's 40,000 tons. And so it just goes back to say, you know, what we're doing here by nature is, is a positive thing for the environment when we're focusing on soil health. So now let's talk about grazing livestock, right? Because we're raising these cover crops. One of the things that we try and do whenever possible is get cattle out on those acres to graze them. Why is that? Well. Cattle are a natural residue cycler, right? That's what they do. They eat grass, they eat, you know, forages and stuff, and then they cycle them. Um, they'll utilize cover crops or excess residues that we would otherwise, otherwise leave out in the field. And the initial thought when you think through that is, well, then you're reducing organic matter because you're taking that organic matter off the soil and you're, you're turning it into protein in an animal. Well, 
I'll jump to my last bullet point here. We found that that isn't the truth. As a matter of fact, we can build organic matter faster when we incorporate livestock. And to me, it probably, if you want to be honest, it goes back to the inefficiency of the grazing animal. There is a certain amount of residue and, uh, you know, cover crop, if you will, that's out there that they won't eat because they'll mash it into the ground. They can't go all the way to the ground to take everything. And so naturally, they're actually incorporating organic matter into the soil by the nature of being out there. We can also lower the feeding cost for that animal, and I'll go into some more detail on that one. Um, it's a key factor in overall soil health improvement. We have found this in our operation uh, again and again and again. Um, there are some negative side effects if you graze livestock on farm ground, farm ground incorrectly. Uh, you can have compaction problems and things like that, but if it's managed right, uh, it really can improve your soil health and it makes the animal healthier. And I've got some slides to talk about that as well. So let's go into organic matter because I'm going to hit on this again and again. It's, it's focusing on organic matter in our operation that's led us to improve our bottom line and improve our soil health. So here's two sets of soil tests. We soil test uh, every acre on our farm. This is a subset, but we soil test every acre of um, farm ground or every field of farm ground every year. So we've got year over year over year tests. And the two graphs next to it are soil test organic matter on some grazed winter wheat, right? So in 2019, when the winter wheat was planted, this specific field here, had an organic matter level of 3.7%. During, during that calendar year from January 8th, 2019 to April 8th, 2020, we grazed that winter wheat with cattle. And this is a cherry picked field, right? And so I wouldn't say these results always happen quite like this, but look at the organic matter a year later. We doubled it. We nearly doubled it. Um, and to me, that's a that, that's an extreme example. We don't see that consistently, but it goes back to, um, we graze this. We didn't harvest it. We didn't have, we didn't raise this crop to harvest it for grain. It was all for cattle to graze. And look what we did to our organic matter levels uh, here. Additionally, on this, on the right side, we've got a full season cover soil test, same deal. Soil test taken at the same time. Um, and we saw a 1% increase in organic matter. This was also grazed by cattle, was not harvested. Um, we improved organic metal matter. Here's farm wide. So we soil tested 8,800 acres of property. So it's not quite all of our farm ground um, in 2020. So this is the April 8th, uh, 2020 soil test that you saw on the last slide. Of those 8,800 acres, 2,300 of them had been grazed by cattle the prior year. And then 6,500 acres had not been grazed, right? Uh, the dark green, R on the chart is the grazed, the average organic matter of the 2,300 acres of grazed land. And the light green is the average organic matter of the 6,500 acres of not grazed land. On average, we added a half a percent of or over a half a percent of organic matter by grazing cattle. Now, once again, what does this go back to? In my opinion, you know, the cattle aren't bringing anything out there. They're not adding anything new. It's they're cycling what's there. They're incorporating it into the soil, soil, soil profile quicker. Um, they're using their hoofs to incorporate some of that stuff and getting it in the soil where it can get utilized. That's what's happening here. Um, and I'm going to call it a positive because any, anywhere we can pick up organic matter uh, is a positive thing. So let's talk about just more specifically the interaction of cattle and crops and carbon. Once again, a half a percent of organic matter on 2,300 acres of ground is a lot of tons of carbon. If we're going to if we're going to be adding three, you know, sequestering three tons per acre, that's what is that? Seven thousand tons of carbon that those cattle helped us sequester. Um, and so, from an environmentalist perspective, I'll, I'll talk about this all day long because what we're doing out here is positive, right? So let's get into some economics of grazing livestock on cropland because this is the hallmark of where we found we can, I've already shown we can improve soil health by improving organic matter by grazing livestock. Now let's talk about economics and the actual bottom line. So in our operation, the majority of what we graze is bulls. We have 4,000 bulls, um, which gives us a lot of opportunities to graze them. Uh, and so generally, you know, we try and get as many um, 24 to 28 month old bulls out grazing as, excuse me, not 24, um, 18 to 24 months old bulls out grazing during the winter as we possibly can. 
in 2019, we grazed 750 bulls between October 1st of 19 and March 1st of 2020. It amassed to over 100,000 grazing days on cropland and residues because of those bulls. And with the bulls, we grazed 1,358 acres. Here's a chart of our turnout dates uh, on bulls. So what you'll notice here is we kind of do it in groups of 200. We started out with 400 there on October 1st. We turned out two groups then, turned out another 200, basically November 1st, uh, another 100, basically December 1st. And then we start to bring them back in uh, with the with the last group coming in around March 1st. That's kind of our timeline when we really try and hit this hard. Uh, and it's important to note here because this is dormant season grazing, right? There's, we don't rotationally graze these bulls because there's no point to doing it this time of year. Point of rotational grazing is to give grass rest time so it can regrow and not sacrifice the root. We're not out here to do that. All we're out here to do in the winter is take advantage of some of those residues um, and cheapen the cost of development for us on the bull side. So here's just a cost example, and I apologize, this is gonna be, for those of you that don't appreciate numbers like I do, this is gonna be a little tough to look at. Um, but this is one of our grazing zones. Uh, it was a total of 960 acres, of which I would say 300 of them were, were costable acres. And what I mean by that was there was crop out here that we harvested with the bulls. The rest of those acres, you know, basically the 600 acres that I don't have as cost acres, or things like corn stubble or you know mile stubble, where that whole cost scenario is taken care of with the harvesting of the crop. That's what we did it for. So everything else after that, there's no cost associated with it. But the cover crop, like here, you know that fifty dollars an acre, um, we're harvesting it with these bulls and these food plots. You know we hunt pheasants with them, but we're harvesting them uh, with the bulls. So on this nine hundred and sixty acres, uh, we had about thirty thousand dollars in cost. And when I say $30,000, that is all in cost. That is allocated labor, that is equipment time, that is rent, that is insurance, that is all the seed, all the herbicide, all the fertilizer, everything. So I'm not you know, just glossing at these costs. And this is an all in cost uh, out here for these bulls. So that's their feed cost, basically $30,000. Um, we graze it for 95 days with 300 bulls. That means we amassed 28,500 grazing days. To get your cost per head per day, take the cost of available feed divided by the head days, and you end up with a dollar six. It costs us one dollar and six cents to, to feed these bulls for 95 days, right? And so here's that. There it is again, a dollar six. Um, if I take that same set of bulls, those 300 bulls, and I leave them in our feedlot in ideal, and I deliver feed to them every day um, that has been harvested, taken into our kitchen, we call it, prepared for them, it costs us $2.75. So in effect, we have saved ourselves basically $1.70 a head a day by turning these animals out and grazing them, um, which doesn't sound like a lot. You know, $1.70 doesn't seem like a big deal until you do that 28,500 times. Uh, and that turns into big numbers pretty quick. And so just in this subset of our 2019 grazing, we saved ourselves $50,000 in feed costs, more or less, which equates to $160 per head or $50 per acre, if you, depending on how you want to measure it. And these results are not inconsistent with what we have seen in the past. I would say our average savings from grazing is about a dollar, probably $1.70, right where we're looking. So this is not something that is an aberration. We've been doing this in a big way for about six years now. Um, and I have seen this cost per day of grazing get as low as 80, 75, 80 cents. And I've seen it be as high as where feeding them in a feedlot maybe made more sense. But on average, we're saving ourselves about $1.70, um, which adds up in a big way. And it adds up in a big way when you look at it like this. Uh, here's our overall grazing results in 2019. So this green bar is grass pasture, right? This is, this is our, our mother cows, our females out grazing grass. What I wanna focus on though is um, the grass and cover crop and the residues. In total, we, that's, that's 140,000 grazing days, right? 140,000 grazing days that on average cost us $1.47. So we are saving ourselves $1.25 times 140,000. That is a large number. On our operation, 
it's probably been the difference for us some years about, you know, whether we're making money or not, our practices like this. Um, and so this is something that's tried and true and has made a big difference for us. Now, let's not forget, this is just straight up analyzing this from a, from a cost of grazing perspective. What I am not accounting for here is the improvement in organic matter we've seen, which leads to lower input costs, um, you know, better yields, however you want to look at it, more profit potential. That's not factored into this. This is just straight up animal grazing savings. Um, so we're, we're, we're improving our bottom line there and we're improving soil health. And I haven't even measured all the bottom line stuff yet. Now let's talk about the health benefits of grazing animals versus having them in a feedlot. So once again, we have a lot of bulls. Uh, and if those of you on this webinar, you know, have cattle and have dealt with bulls in the past, I'm sure you're aware they are, they're not fun to deal with. They're, I'm not going to say they're mean, but you know, a 24 month old bull is sort of like a 17 to 18 year old kid. When you get two or 300 24, you know, 18 year old kids together, um, where you, you get a lot of, you know, fighting, rough housing, things like that. Bulls do the same thing. We seem to test all of our bulls every year. We have to, to, that we know we're sending out a good product to our customers. And here's what we found. Uh, in 2019, we seem and tested about 1,350 24 month old bulls. Of those 1,350, we, 500 of them got out to graze and 850 didn't. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on here is the pass rate. Pa the, the semen test pass rate uh, of our bulls that grazed on cover crop was 4% higher, just a raw 4% higher than had we left them in the feedlot. These two over here are, are some semen health indicators, uh, percent normal cells and scrotal circumference. There's really no significant difference there. So what's going on? What's going on here is these animals are physically getting injured less uh, when they're out grazing. And when you think through that for a second, when they're confined in the feedlot, which I'm not gonna bash feedlots, we have one, we use it a lot, um, but they're confined, right? They're in a small space. Um, they're fighting for room at a bunk. You know, they're crammed with each other all day long as compared to turning 300 bulls out on 900 acres. That gives them, each bull has three acres out there, which is, you know, what is that? 140,000 square feet on his own. Um, they're spread out. They don't, they're not, confined next to each other all day long. So they don't get hurt as much. They don't fight. They don't break legs. Uh, and here's what we found. The animal is healthier. It is just is the bottom line when they're out grazing on residues and cropland. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, 2020 forage wheat. So this is I, the, the soil health, the soil tests of the, the forage wheat and the full season cover where I showed that. This is that. Um, we grazed 70 acres of forage wheat and 300 acres of full season cover uh, in 2020. We did this with steers and heifers um, from the 21st of May till the 19th of August. We rotated on the forage wheat early. Uh, once again, this is forage winter wheat that we planted specifically to graze. So we rotated through it for a month. We grazed it before it was mature um, and amassed quite a few grazing days on that, grazed it out and then moved all the cattle to some full season cover, basically a half section of full season cover and grazed it for two months. So we got basically 90 days uh, of grazing out of these two scenarios. Um, and here's kind of the end result. This is a photo of the animals out getting turned into some of the full season cover here, which once again was a blend uh, we got from uh, green cover seed. Uh, we had 354 acres with a total cost of more or less $55,000. Um, during this 90 day period, we amassed 21,000 grazing days which means it cost us $2.62 to graze those animals. Now, compared to like the $1.06 or the average $1.47, I wouldn't call this uh, a win. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, from a cost perspective, I don't even know if I would say that it makes sense financially just to do that, right? It, it wasn't a loss by any means. We weren't a whole lot worse off, if at all, uh, but it wasn't a, a raging success. Um, but here's the difference. We grazed it for 90 days and we let that full season cover rest. We went back out there and dormant season grazed it with bulls until just a few weeks ago, picked up an additional 5,000 grazing days and brought the cost down to $2.10, um, which once again isn't $1.50, 
but we're, we're saving money on a deal like that. And so here we, here we are really maxing out the soil health benefit. This is a full season cover, you know, where we're, we're, we've got a lot of different species out there and the whole goal is to make the soil healthier. Um, I'm putting all the land cost in on this because it's a dedicated acre to this full season cover. Um, it's not cheap to do uh, by any means, but it still makes sense. And so in a, in a maxed out scenario, where we're really gonna try and get holistic here and you know, say, turn some acres over just for animals to be on, it does make financial sense. If you can really maximize, rotationally graze it right, and maximize those grazing days, um, it can make a lot of sense for you. And we haven't soil tested these acres yet, but I'm gonna guess we're gonna find an improvement in organic matter once again. Uh, logically, that would be the next, you know, it would follow that that it would be what happens. Um, but this kind of stuff, you know, has been successful on our operation. And, you know, I'm getting towards the end of my presentation here. And I, I want to talk about this picture. And I apologize, all this is a picture. I cannot give you the full experience. But I mentioned cover crops. And, and part of that slide, talk about habitat, right? Um, and how it's good for the deer and the pheasants. And if you really look close on this, you can see some birds flying around. And I took this picture because I was walking through this full season cover blend one day and it wasn't windy, which is, is a blessing out here in central South Dakota. It was just a beautiful day. And I stopped for a second and there you got this beautiful purple, you know, Physelia, I believe it's called, and this thick lush cover. And there were butterflies everywhere and there were birds chirping and there's deer running in the background. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, I wish someone, you know, on the left coast could see this, see what we're doing. Um, Keith mentioned early, this is not 20 acres in my backyard. This is 300 acres of this stuff. Um, we farm 13,000 acres. This is not an uncommon practice for us. By all means, we are a factory farm. We really are. But we can still do that. We can still be a factory farm. We can still stay in business. We can keep our animals healthy. We can keep the soil healthy and we can make money. Everyone thinks that, you know, you're in this, ultimately you're in it to make money, right? And we are, but look what we can do while we, while we make money. We can make the environment better off. We can sequester carbon. We can hold nutrients and keep them from getting into the water supply, which is a big problem for a lot of city folk. Um, and I, I wish I could bring someone from Los Angeles out here and sit them down in this field of cover crop and say, just listen to this for a second. We did this on 700 acres. We're a large farm. What is wrong with this? Tell me what's wrong with it. And the answer is there's nothing wrong. What we're doing out here is right, guys. And I'm not trying to pat our own back. We're not the only people doing this. Um, but we're making a difference. And it's this kind of movement that I think that is going to, that needs to be shared more with people that don't, you know, don't like egg because to me, it's the way of the future. And uh, it's beautiful. It really is. So with that, uh, I left 15 minutes for question and answer. I hope that's all right, guys. And uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and maybe we'll jump right into questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nick. That was, that was great. Um, with that, like you said, we do have about 15 minutes worth of uh, time here for some questions if you guys have any. So I'll let you guys either type those out in the chat or you can do that on, on Q&A. And if, if you're watching on Facebook as well, I know we've got several people on there. Um, I am watching the Facebook feed as well. So if you guys have comments, we will we'll try to get to those. First question from Dale. Uh, he says, why cover crop before corn instead of cover crop, soybean, and then corn? Cover crop, soybean, and then corn. Probably comes down to a rotational deal for us. To be honest, I'm going to get caught off guard with that question because I I've never thought of it that way. We, here's why. Here's why we do winter wheat, cover crop, corn. We raise a lot of winter wheat and there's a big dormant period for us. We harvest that stuff um, on average, you know, we're, we got all the wheat out by August 1st. And that ground is going to sit bare from August 1st until May, June 1st when the corn emerges the next year. So what is that, nine months? probably our widest window of a non-living root in the soil system. So it was a natural fit for us. In August, we can still get something planted and have it come up and, and do really well. Um, and so that's the justification for why we do what we do, if, if, if that's a fair answer. Um, 
question from Doug. How do you get cover crop to grow after winter wheat and how do you graze all winter? Well, we get it to grow by praying for rain, first of all, because that's probably the biggest, uh, biggest thing for us. If we can get a crop in and get it up by August 1st, you know, that gives us 60, maybe 90 days before we get a really hard freeze, which is ample time to get a good cover crop up, right? Uh, it's just whether we get the rainfall or not. You know, historically in South Dakota, you might not get those August rains. Um, there's years we do, there's years we don't. And, and so the short answer is we, we pray for rain. And then how do we graze all winter? That's another wild card that mother nature, we kind of rely on. Uh, if, if we don't have three foot of snow on the ground, we will graze all winter long. Um, those bulls and cattle really in general, will pick through a certain amount of snow, right? You know, they'll, they'll dig through six or eight inches or maybe even a foot of snow to get down to those turnips and those radishes and all that stuff on the ground. Um, but we have had years where we've had to cut that grazing short because you know, we got a three foot blizzard on the, as a matter of fact, 20, 2019, excuse me, the year before last was a really good example of our grazing season just got hammered because we got a blizzard on December 1st. Um, and so we're, they, the short answer is we're reliant on mother nature for all of that. If she, if she does things right for us, uh, it can work really well. Uh, Henry asks, when you get to 4.5 organic matter, what do you expect the following year? So if you look historically for us, um, we've been tracking soil organic matter on our soil since I've got soil tests going back to 1998. Um, we're going to add a half a percent on average is, is, is not normal in like a year. It's not usually that much. Uh, we're probably more like, if you were to, to look at it over the last 20 years, it's probably more like a 10th or, or maybe, you know, a fifth, you know, 0.15 percent, you know, 15 percent or however you want to do the math there, I apologize, 0.15 percent organic matter a year. And so the answer is when you get to 4.5, um, I would expect, you know, that with the stuff we're doing, there's nothing stopping us from going to five or five and a half. Um, you know, that takes time. You know, another 10, 15 years. I would imagine at some point those would level out and there's probably a point in time when you, you know, six or seven is awful high, but four and a half isn't some sort of barrier that I would, that I would kind of be watching. Sure. So kind of along that same lines, at what depth have you been taking your soil organic matter tests? Zero to six. Okay. Zero to six is where we're, where we're watching them. Caleb Johnson asks, how can you get winter wheat in after corn? As far yeah, as I think, I think that's a, I think we got, I need to explain that better. So we don't do winter wheat after corn. We do corn after winter wheat. It's flipped. Winter wheat, cover crop in between, and then corn the following growing season. Now we've experimented with some other cover crop concepts, especially this year, 2020, we tried a lot of different stuff. Um, we interseeded corn we interseeded cover crop into 60 inch row corn, right? So we, we did skip row corn and then air seeded cover shop crop in between. Uh, we did the same thing on Milo. You know, there's a lot of other opportunities to try these things. Full season covers is another one. Um, but for us, the big ticket cover crop has always been behind winter wheat. Uh, Christina says, have you monitored changes in your infiltration rate? Have we monitored changes? I, I don't think so. Uh, we have we have looked at our infiltration rate, um, and to be honest with you, I, I'm I'm going to fall off. My my knowledge is going to fall off here. Brian is the one who has gone through those tests before, and I'm gonna I'm gonna speak off memory here. It could very well be wrong, but we've had um, done those soil infiltration tests where we're taking an inch of water in like five minutes. Uh, you know, is is something just a, outrageously fast that you would not expect. Um, and you know, to, to me, it goes back to, you know, we're no-till, we've got that organic matter out there and, you know, good soil texture because of it and you get good infiltration. Okay. Uh, this kind of goes back to the, the issue of grazing all winter. How much snow is too much snow to get through? When do you know that it's time to, to pull them off? Um, you know, I, I would say probably a anything over a foot gets kind of tough if you got a foot of snow cover on average. Um, but the bigger thing we key off of really, the animal will tell you. 
when there's when they're out of feed or they can't get to it because the first thing they'll do is they'll hit the fence lines um and you you can tell they'll, they'll be standing at the fence as a matter of fact a bull not only will he stand at the fence but he will physically hit the fence line and he'll be out right and then you know at that point you kind of know it's time to either get some hay to him or get him back in the lot um, that's what we key off is the animal itself sending us a signal okay uh, Jonathan asked kind of a different uh, topic here, but what is your advice for first generation farmers? Obviously, you have been a part of the something that's been around for a long time, but how would you suggest talking with older non family farmers about renting land and putting these types of regenerative techniques into practice when they see themselves growing conventionally? Yeah, and you know this I've had I've had other people tell me this is a tough one. Uh, you know, you get a landlord that maybe isn't isn't bought into the concept of, of what you're doing, right? You know, they don't see the value in playing a cover crop. I, I saw a comment over here about, you know, we're worried about using up too much moisture, which, you know, to a certain point is a valid concern, right? Um, you know, additionally, tying up nutrients can be another one. Hurting yield is another valid concern. And I guess my advice would be, you know, I, I've got some economics, I've done them here on our operation. I mean, I'm an economist, but don't, don't, I have an economics degree, but don't let me fool you into thinking this is hard math, you guys, it's, it's not, it doesn't take, it's, this is by all accounts, back of the envelope, very quick math that I'm doing on this stuff, right? It's not complex. It's not complicated. You just have to know your cost is the big thing. Once you know your cost, figuring all this out is easy. And I'm saying that to tell you, you know, as a, as a first generation operator trying to get into these soil health practices, take a resource, you know, like me, there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter and have done more work and show them. I mean, this isn't, we're, we're to the point now in this, in this soil health movement, if you want to call it that, I wouldn't call it a movement. I mean, I think it's just, it's a natural progression of we're finding out that this makes sense uh, on operations. Take the results and show them, hey, you don't need to be worried about yield because, I mean, look at what all these operations or these universities have found is that you don't have yield problems, right? Um, I'm not gonna hurt your ground. As a matter of fact, I'm doing you a favor because I'm building organic matter on ground I'm leasing from you, right? I mean, I'm making your soil better, which helps me as the operator, right? I'm looking at better yield, more moisture retention, less nutrient loss. But at the end of the day, you are, you're building, you're improving someone else's resource is what you're doing. To me, that should be the easiest sell in the world as to a landlord. Um, so that'd be a piece of advice, you know, I. I, to be honest with you, we don't have a lot of issues with our landlords, you know, coming across as concerned. Frankly, I kind of hold the opinion of once you lease land to someone, you kind of give up the right to tell them what to do. But I'm, I'm not going to get into that uh, any more than that. Yeah, and I would kind of even just add to that as far as, like Keith mentioned, we've got these webinars recorded and, you know, show them this or take notes from a presentation like this, give them the numbers that show not just that you're improving your own yield because that doesn't necessarily affect the, the farmer or the landowner, but the, the issues of organic matter and how you're improving that asset for the next person that wants to lease that ground. Right. Um, with that, I guess, uh, on the topic of yield not being as important, what is your typical yield for winter wheat and corn, if you don't mind answering? Yeah, um, average, average yield for winter wheat out here is probably 60 bushel an acre, somewhere between 60 and 65. Um, this year it was 70. We had a phenomenal, phenomenal year uh, for winter wheat. Uh, for corn, I, I think the, the county average yield is probably 100 to 110. Um, and I, I would say we fall right in that average. This year we did 125. Um, we didn't get more moisture than normal, but we got it at the right times. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's kind of where we're at yield-wise there. Um, you know, just a real quick yield comparison on the 60-inch corn study we've done. Now, a lot of people have asked me, you know, what, what ended up happening? You know, you got 60. So we plant like a 24,005 population on average in this part of the world, right? And so what we did was we took that 24,5 and we turned it into a 49,000 in a 60 inch row, right? So we doubled the population in the 60 inch rows, but we left the amount of fertilizer in the row the same. So we were effectively, effectively half rating the nitrogen um, and then growing another crop in between these rows. On the 400 acres that we did a 60 inch corn, our yield loss was 8%. It was 8% yield loss. It averaged, I think, 111 
in the 30s and like 103 or 102 uh, in the 60s. Now, you're going to look at that and you're going to think, well, all right, it doesn't make a lot of sense until you realize that we had an 8% yield loss on half the nitrogen and we grew a cover crop in the meantime. Um, and so where I kind of see this going, frankly, long term is that's a real good scenario for like a silage corn. If you're gonna try and graze stuff, take silage corn off the 1st of September when your cover crop's still green and you've just got an, just a pile of grazing out there, an, an immense amount of grazing that you can consolidate those numbers and probably make a bang up economics case um, for that practice. So something to be happy with there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, we have a comment, <laughs> focus on profit, not yield. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about is Bingo. Too, too often we focus on how much did you make? And it's like, well, that it, whether or not that's paying the bills and you're truly making profit. And like you said, knowing your costs is the only way to really know if you're making any money. And so that's, that's huge. We've got two I, questions here. Oh, go ahead. I will take a 8% reduction in yield for a 25% reduction in cost. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's an absolute no brainer from an economics perspective. You are better off there. Yep. Uh, we got two questions involving uh, compaction as far as, you know, the, the high risk of when your soils are wet, um, when it's not frozen. Do you have any advice for these time periods? Do you pull them off uh, to feed them hay? And then Jim asks, have you checked your compaction with a penetrometer? Uh, no, I have not checked compaction with the penetrometer. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't say that we physically measured it. Now, all I have is observational examples from a yield map, right? And we, I mean, I'm going to be honest, we have had places where it was obvious that those cattle were, generally it happens along fence lines and around waters, right? You know, if they got a place that they're congregating where 200 bulls are going to go to go get water, you'll see compaction. And then as you get further away, it gets better off. So we've seen places where it is, it has hurt our yield. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, it. It comes down to a management thing. And, you know, for us, we should have caught that earlier and, you know, moved them off, got them back in the feedlot or, you know, fed hay somewhere to get them to not congregate as much. But back to the, the soil, you know, the moist soil thing, where we run into that problem most is the full season grazing. When we're grazing cattle, like in May, you know, on farm ground, that's one where we have... Um, delayed our grazing time because we're wet, or we have moved animals off um, farm ground uh, back onto pasture simply because we knew we were going to have a mess from a compaction perspective. Um, you know, the other thing that's important to remember about that too is when we graze bulls, they're not, they're not intensely grazed, if you will, right? I mean, this is 300 bulls on 900 acres. They're not packed in there. When we're rotationally grazing on winter wheat in May, we'll take 300 heifers and put them on 40 acres because that's the idea right is is small paddocks short grazing intervals and you move them right and so your compaction risk is a lot higher when you're packing them in tight like that and we have canceled plans before um you know just to make it better off um have, are you penalized at all by crop insurance using those cover crops i mean so on the corn and the, and the milo where we interceded, yes, you do. You, you do get, you can't insure it, right? Now, like the cover crop behind winter wheat, that's one that doesn't matter, you know, because it's off before the corn goes, before the corn starts to grow. Um, but yeah, like the, the interceded stuff is a challenge. And then like a lot of the, the full season covered, you know, you're, you're not insuring that. Our mixed species forage, we're not insuring that. So the short answer is yes, we are. And I'm looking at I'm looking at the thing here, the left coast comment. I apologize about that. I, I wasn't trying to be insensitive. Uh, I was I was more getting at the point of there are a lot of people that don't see egg in a positive light. That was probably what I meant there. Um, and to, to be honest with you, it, it does come from the the urban coastal part of the United States. I mean, that's just the honest to goodness truth. Um, you know, that's well, egg is losing there in some in some cases, right? I'm not going to say. 100%, I'm sure there are places where it's understood, but if you're gonna have someone who's got a bad impression on egg, it's gonna be there. And that was kind of the point. So I apologize for being a little bit, um, a little snarky with that. 
Um, it is 6.30, so I think we're probably going to wrap up, but I, I do want to get to this last question from Jerry Daniels. Can you explain your water needs for the cattle in winter grazing? Yeah. Um, so we try and do it where we've got a, a, a rural hydrant close. Uh, we do have some artesian water, which is real deep, warm water. That works better. Um, but that can be the hardest part. What we, what we try and get ourselves is some energy-free insulated waters. There's a lot of companies that make them that don't freeze, right? Um, they're small reservoirs, like a 10 gallon reservoir that's just constantly refilling. So it doesn't have a chance to ice over. Um, big open waters, they stink in the winter and they're just, they're terrible to deal with. But when you go back to the slide where I talked about, you know, 8,800 acres of ground soil tested, only 2,300 grazed. The reasons we didn't graze the other 6,500 is because we don't have fence or we don't have water. And it's just honest goodness truth. So we're only grazing where we've got a good insulated water. You know, we're not going to be hauling water to cattle. That's not something that is fun to do. Um, so energy free insulated stuff is what we go for. Yeah. Well, if there's anything, I know there's a couple of questions we didn't get to. If you guys want to get those answered, you can email them to me and I will pass them on to, to Nick. Mm -hmm. uh, my email is just my name, Noah, N-O-A-H at greencoverseed.com. Or you can follow um, the Jorgensen Land and Cattle. They've got a website as well as uh, some Facebook pages for the hunting as well as the, the cattle operation. So I have posted the links to those in the chat if you guys want to go and follow them and learn more about what Nick is doing. With that, Nick, um, I really do appreciate the time that you took to give this presentation for answering questions. Um, is there anything, I guess, that you want to hit on before we I, head out? Just thanks again for having me. It's an honor to do this. Uh, you know, I like, I, like, I like sharing the story of what we're doing. You know, I'm not gonna say everything we're doing is right by any means, um, but you know, we're out here to learn. You know, that, that might be something to bring back to that first generation guy that asked the question, you know, be in this to learn, don't be in this to do what everyone else has always done, right? Because the only way we're gonna get better off is to try things and fail at them sometimes in the, in the means of innovation and improvement. So I really do appreciate it, it's been an honor. Yeah, well, like I said, we, we enjoyed having you on and it was an honor for us to be able to have uh, your expertise and your knowledge and not just the knowledge, but honestly, the, I just see Kat says the, the story aspect of, of why you're doing what you're doing. So we appreciate yeah. that. With that, we Thanks will- Thanks a bunch. Yeah, no problem. I will have this recorded. We'll try to get it posted later this week. I'm not sure with Thanksgiving exactly what time that'll come out, but um, would love for you guys to share this with anybody that you think would benefit from using this data and using this information to uh, improve their operation as well. So thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, next week. We will have our webinar at the same time. I believe it's Adam Doherty next week. So uh, that'll be at 5.30 central time. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next week.